Chapter 4 Magic of Nimue and Morgan Le Fay On the day following that Feast of Pentecost on which the round table was set up in Camelot, King Arthur rode alone in the forest, sorrowing for the strange words of Merlin, and as he rode, suddenly Merlin himself stood before him. I come to bid you farewell, said the good enchanter, and to speak my last word of warning. Have good care of the sword Excalibur, and of the magic scabbard of it, and beware of the evil woman who shall steal it from you, she who shall be the mother of the evil knight who shall strike you down upon the field of Kamlan. Yet she shall be with you at the last, her evil purged away, and she with others shall bring you to Avalon. Of these others, the ladies of Avalon, one awaits me, even the Lady Nimue. She shall bury me in the earth while I yet live." "'May not you escape by your magic arts?' asked Arthur. "'Oh, Merlin, I would not lose you.' "'Nay, it is my fate,' answered Merlin. "'It is to the glory of Logris, "'and for you now you must show your worth and stand alone.' "'Then Merlin went on his way deeper and deeper into the forest, "'following the Lady Nimue, "'and they came to the land of Gwynedd, "'where Pant was king, and lodged in his castle.' And on the morrow, before they went on their way once more, Merlin spoke with King Pant's wife, whose name was Eliane. You have a son, said he, a marvellous youth whom the Lady of the Lake took from you when he lay in the cradle, so that he dwelt with her many years. I would see this boy before I pass from the ways of men, for his name is Lancelot, and another Elaine in the times to be shall bear him as one called Galahad and these two knights shall be the best of all the round table, and the chiefest glory of the realm of Logris. And when Merlin saw Lancelot, he blessed him, and bade him ride to the court of King Arthur before the next feast of Pentecost, and asked to be made a knight, saying that it was Merlin's last wish before he laid himself living in his own grave. And then, while King Pant and King Elaine and young Lancelot marveled at his words, Merlin departed from among them, and went away into the hills of North Wales, while Nimue went before him, playing upon the swythe, the magic harp of Wales, and singing strange songs of weird and wonderful enchantment. At last they came to the place appointed, and there, under the shadow of a fair white hawthorn covered in flowers, Nimue sat down, and Merlin laid his head upon her lap. Then, singing and playing, she wove a great magic round him in nine circles, round Merlin and round the hawthorn bush. Merlin slept and woke again, and now it seemed to him that he dwelt in the fairest tower in the world and the most strong. Lady, he said, you have taken from me all my magic, so that never may I come out of this tower. Stay but with me and leave me not alone in these enchantments. I shall go forth before long, answered Nimue, for King Arthur is in great danger, and now that you may stand by him no longer, I must go to his aid. Morgana le Fay is weaving her wicked spells to entrap him. I must leave you and go speedily. But first I will give you rest, that you may sleep through many centuries until the day dawns before you shall awake. Then, as if walking in his sleep, Merlin rose to his feet and went down a narrow stairway which opened to the ground before him. Down and down he went into a dark stone room beneath a great rock, and he laid himself upon a great slab of stone like a table and fell asleep. Then Nimue, by her magic, closed up the passage leading to the light, and went her way swiftly towards Camelot, leaving Merlin to rest in his dark tomb. And there he lies until the day of his awakening, when the circle of Logris shall be formed once more in this island, but whether he rests in the magic forest of Brocklinade, or in the Isle of Bards in Cornwall Crag, or whether the wood of Bragdon, no one can tell until that day. Meanwhile, King Arthur hunted in the mysterious forests of South Wales with Sir Urentz, his brother-in-law, the husband of Morgana le Fay, and with the brave knight Sir Accolon of Gaul. Far and fast they followed a certain great heart, mile after mile, until they were quite lost in the forest, so fast that at length their horses fell dead under them, and still they followed that heart, for it too was now so weary that it could hardly move. They came out from under the trees, down a grassy bank, and saw the heart fall to earth and die. And then, looking round, they discovered that the bank sloped down to a great sheet of water, and that a small ship, 
all hung with rich silks, was drawing in beside the shore. The ship came right to them, running in against the sand so that they could step aboard. But there was no living thing to be seen anywhere upon the ship. Sirs, said King Arthur, let us enter this strange bog and dare the adventure of it. So they went aboard and found it a passing fair ship, very richly furnished and draped with rare silks. It was evening when they came down the bank to the water side, and the night fell rapidly after they had stepped on to the ship, so rapidly that in a few minutes it was pitch dark. Then suddenly great torches appeared all along the bulwarks, so that the decks were brilliantly lit. The ship moved across the still dark waters, while twelve fair damsels came out from the cabins and served them with all the meats and wines that ever a man could desire. Sweet music played softly all the while, and the whole ship was fragrant with the heavy scent of strange flowers. The king and his two companions were weary after their day's hunting, and after they had supped and enjoyed the cool night air on the deck of that strange vessel, each of them was led below to a rich cabin prepared for him alone. And before long each of them was laid in a soft, comfortable bed, and that night they slept most marvelously deep. On the morrow Urentz woke to find himself at Camelot, in his own bed, beside his wife, the enchantress Morgana le Fay, and much he marveled how he came two days' journey during one night's sleep. His wife smiled deeply and mysteriously, a strange evil light glimmering behind her great dark eyes. But she said nothing of the matter, though well she knew. King Arthur, however, woke to find himself in a dark and dismal prison, a damp, unwholesome dungeon beneath some great castle, and he heard in the darkness the groans of twenty knights who were also held there in cruel captivity. "'Who are you that so complain?' asked King Arthur. And one of them replied, "'We are twenty knights kept prisoner here, and there are some of us who have been here as long as eight years.' "'How does this happen?' asked Arthur. "'The lord of this castle,' answered the knight, "'is an evil man called Sir Damas, who wrongly holds the castle and lands from his elder brother,' the good knight Sir Outlake, and he takes captive all those who come to the castle and shuts them in this miserable dungeon. As they were talking, there came a damsel bearing a lamp and said to Arthur, What cheer, sir? I hardly know, he answered, nor can I tell how I came to be in this evil place. Sir, said she, you shall be set at liberty and win the freedom of all these knights also, if you will but fight for my lord for his brother will this day send a champion to do battle for him, and whoso wins shall become lord of all these lands. Now, said Arthur, you have set me a hard question. Your lord, Sir Damas, is an evil knight, and I would not strike a blow in his defense. Yet had I rather die in battle than linger to my death in this dungeon. If Sir Damas will release all those who lie prisoned here, I will do battle to the death in his quarrel. It shall be so, said the damsel. Then I am ready, said Arthur. If I had but a horse and armor, you shall lack neither, she assured him. Do but follow me. They came up from the dungeon and out into the clear sunlight of the courtyard. Surely, damsel, I have seen you before, said King Arthur. Were you ever at King Arthur's court? No, answered the damsel. I never came there in all my life. I am but the daughter of Sir Damas, lord of this castle. But she spoke falsely when she said this, for she was one of the damsels who served Queen Morgana le Fay. At the same moment that Arthur found himself in the dungeon beneath Sir Damas's castle, Sir Acalon of Gaul woke also from his charmed sleep and found himself lying in a pleasant courtyard, but at the very edge of a deep well, so that if he had moved but a little, he would have fallen into it and found his death many, many feet beneath. When Sir Acalon found where he was, he blessed himself and said, Now may God save King Arthur and King Urentz, for those damsels in the ship have betrayed us. Surely they were fiends and not women. If ever I escape from this adventure, I will slay all women who deal thus in black magic and wicked enchantments. While he was thinking this, there came a dwarf with a great mouth and a flat nose, and saluted Sir Acalon, saying, I come from your lady, Queen Morgana le Fay, and she greets you well as her dear love, and begs you for her sake to fight for her this day with a strange knight, and for this she sends you King Arthur's own sword Excalibur and its scabbard, and bids you fear not, but do battle to the death without any mercy, 
as she has instructed you. She bid me also to tell you that her husband lies dying, wounded to the death by a traitor's hand, and that you shall wed her and be king of Gore in his stead. I did indeed promise to fight for her, said Sir Accolon, and you come truly from her, since you bear the sword Excalibur. All these enchantments must be her doing, so that I might do battle against her unknown enemy and slay him. Sir, it is even as you say, answered the dwarf, and you do well to fight in this battle. Then he drew Sir Accolon from the side of the well, and afterwards led him to the hall of the castle, where Sir Outlake awaited him with six squires. When Sir Accolon had eaten and drunk, these armed him in strong armor, set him upon a mighty war-horse, and led him to the field of battle midway between the castles of Sir Outlake and Sir Damas, in a fair green meadow. Meanwhile six squires of Sir Damas had led Arthur also to the hall of their master's castle, given him food and drink, armed him well, and led him out of the gate. As Arthur rode from the castle another damsel came to him, bowed low, and said, Sir, your sister, my mistress, Queen Morgana le Fay, greets you, and she sends me to bring you your sword Excalibur, which you left in her keeping, for she hears that this day you must engage in battle. Here is the sword and the scabbard also, and my mistress kneels even now in prayer for your safety. King Arthur thanked the damsel and went towards the battle with a lighter heart, now that he had his own sword, and the magic scabbard, the wearer of which would never lose much blood, however sorely he was wounded. These two knights, King Arthur and Sir Accolon, in strange armor with closed visors and no devices on their shields to show who they were, met together in the green meadow, neither knowing the other. They jousted with their spears, first of all, so mightily that neither might sit his horse. Then they drew their swords and went eagerly to battle, smiting many great strokes. But always King Arthur's sword failed to bite as Accolon's did, for Accolon's sword bit through King Arthur's armor at every stroke, until his blood ran down and dyed all the meadow. But Accolon bled scarcely at all, though Arthur had wounded him once or twice. And when King Arthur saw his blood upon the grass, and felt how the sword in his hand bit not into the steel as it was wont to do, while Accolon's drew blood at every stroke, he felt that there had been treason and black magic used to change the swords, for he became more and more certain that in Accolon's hand gleamed the true Excalibur. Now, Sir Knight, beware, for I am going to hit you again, taunted Sir Accolon. Arthur, without replying, struck so hard that he went staggering back, but Accolon struck once and Arthur fell to the ground. He was soon up again, however, and they struck many more great strokes at one another, but always King Arthur lost so much blood that it was a marvel that he still stood on his feet, and only so brave a knight could have fought on while enduring such pain. At last the two of them paused to rest, and all those who had gathered to watch the battle spoke well of them, but lamented that one of two such brave knights was doomed to die, and amongst those who watched was the enchantress Lady Nimue of Avalon, she who had put Merlin under the stone, and who had arrived only after the battle had begun. This is no time for me to suffer you to rest, exclaimed Sir Accolon suddenly, and thereat he came fiercely against Arthur once more. But Arthur, wild with rage and pain, whirled up his sword and smote Accolon so hard upon the helmet that he fell to the earth. But at that stroke the sword broke to pieces in his hand, leaving only the hilt and crossbar. Accolon sprung up again and rushed at King Arthur, who defended himself with his shield, though certain that now there was no escape. Knight, jeered Accolon, yield you to me as craven and vanquished, or else I will smite off your head with my sword. Nay, said Arthur, I cannot so shame my vows. If it were possible for me to die a hundred times, I would rather that. For though I lack weapon, yet shall I lack no honor, and if you slay me weaponless, it is you who will be shamed. I'll take the risk of that, cried Accolon. Run away now, for you are no better than a dead corpse already. He slashed at Arthur again, but the king took the blow on his shield and hit Accolon across the visor with the broken sword so hard that he staggered back three paces. As he did so, Nimue, by her magic, loosened the scabbard at his side so that it fell to the ground in front of Arthur, who caught it up and buckled it to his belt. Accolon came on once more, struck a stroke that might have cleft Arthur's head to the chin, 
but Nimue waved her hand once more, and the sword twisted from Archelon's fingers and landed point downwards in the ground. Arthur leapt forward, took the sword in his hand, and knew at once, by the feel of it, that it was his own Excalibur. Aha! he cried. You have been from me all too long, and you have done me much damage. And then to Achelon, Sir Knight, it is you who stand near to death. For this my own sword shall reward you well for the pain I have endured and the blood I have lost. Therewith he leapt at Sir Achelon and smote him to the ground so hard that the blood burst out from his mouth and nose and ears, and he stood over him with Excalibur raised to strike, crying, Now I will slay you. Slay me you well may, gasped Achelon, for never will I yield. I also vowed by my knighthood never to yield this life. Slay me, therefore, since I will not live shamed. You are a brave knight and an honorable, said Arthur, lowering his sword. Tell me of what land you are and who you serve. Sir, I am of the royal court of King Arthur, and Achelon of Gaul is my name. Tell me, who gave you the sword? asked the king, much dismayed as he remembered the magic of the ship. A sorrowful sword it has been, said Achelon, for by it I have got my death. That may well be, said the king, but how came it into your hands? From Queen Morgana le Fay, answered Achelon sadly. I have loved her long, and she me, and I promised to fight and slay whom she would, even though it were Arthur the king, for which reason she sent me the sword this day, telling me that her husband, King Urentz, was dead, and I should be king indeed if I conquered in this battle. But tell me, who are you that she would have had me slay? Oh, Achelon, said Arthur. Do you not know that I am the king? When Achelon heard this, he cried out aloud, Fair sweet lord, King Arthur, have mercy on me, for I knew you not. Mercy you shall have, answered Arthur, for I see that this battle was not your doing, but my sister's. Oh, Achelon, she has deceived me also by her beauty and her magic wiles. The good Merlin warned me, but I would not take warning. Now will I send her from my court, or slay her if she bring any man to his death. Then King Arthur made peace between Sir Damas and Sir Outlake, and when he had done this, their squires carried him and Sir Achelon, who was even more badly wounded, to the abbey nearby in the forest, and Nimue came with them and tended on them. Sir Achelon died of his hurts before the next sun rose, but Arthur recovered slowly. Meanwhile, Queen Morgana le Fay, thinking him to be dead, was continuing at Camelot with her wicked plans. On the very day of the battle she found her husband, King Urintz, lying asleep on his couch, and at once she called one of her damsels to her and said, Go fetch me my lord's sword, for I never saw a better moment than this wherein to slay him. Ah, oh, madam, cried the damsel, do not do this thing. You will never escape if you murder your husband. That is no concern of yours, answered Morlagan le Fay. This day have I decreed that he shall die, so fetch me the sword quickly. Away went the damsel, but she sought out Prince Uwain first of all, and said, Sir, come quickly and wait on my lady your mother, for she is just going to murder the king your father. I am fetching the sword for her to do it. Bring her the sword quickly, said Sir Uwain, or she shall slay you also. With trembling hands the damsel brought the sword to Morgana le Fay, who went swiftly to where King Urentz lay sleeping. But as she raised the sword to strike, Sir Uwain sprang out from behind the hangings and seized her arm. Ah, fiend, he hissed, what wickedness are you at? Were you not my mother, I would kill you here and now. I think you are a devil and not a woman. Have mercy on me, begged Morgana. It was the devil who tempted me to this deed. The fiends of darkness are ever ready to lead astray those who know too much of their secret arts. You shall vow upon the holy sacrament never to attempt such a deed again, said Uwain, and this is the oath Morgana le Fay pledged herself. And a little while later one of her damsels came to tell her that Achelon was slain and King Arthur resting at the abbey in the forest. When he returns to Camelot, she thought, he will surely slay me for striving to bring about his death. I will go speedily from the court before he comes. Then she set out with her men-at-arms and her damsels, but she told Queen Guinevere that she was going riding in the forest. On her way, Queen Morgana le Fay came to the abbey where Arthur lay recovering from his wounds, and suddenly she thought that now at least she could steal his sword Excalibur. The king lies sleeping on his bed, she was told. 
and gave command that no one was to wake him. I am his sister, answered Morgana very sweetly. Let me come just to watch by his side for a little while, there to pray for his speedy recovery. So they brought her where he was, and left her with him. She found Arthur lying asleep with the sword Excalibur naked in his right hand, but the scabbard leant against a chair at his bedside. At least I can take this from him, she thought. And hiding it beneath her cloak, she went quietly out of the abbey, mounted her horse, and rode on her way. Presently King Arthur woke and missed his scabbard. Then he was very angry and asked who had been there while he slept, and they told him that it was Queen Morgana le Fay. Alas, said Arthur, falsely have you watched me. Sir, they answered, we durst not disobey your sister's commands. Then Arthur called for horses, and he and Sir Outlake went galloping through the forest after Queen Morgana le Fay and her attendants. Before long they saw them, and the chase became fast and furious. Nearer and nearer came Arthur and Outlake, until at last she realized that there was no escape. Then she rode to a deep lake in the forest and threw the scabbard into the middle of it, crying, Whatever happens to me, I will at least make sure that my brother never has his scabbard again. And it sank, for it was heavy with gold and precious jewels. After this, Queen Morgana le Fay led her followers into a valley filled with great stones, and by her magic turned herself and all of them into stones also, so that when King Arthur and Sir Outlake came among them a few minutes later, neither Morgana le Fay nor any of her people was to be seen. Here has been an evil magic, said Arthur, crossing himself, and when they had searched long and vainly for the scabbard, they rode back to the abbey and thence to Camelot, where Guinevere and all the fellowship of the round table rejoiced greatly to see them. But as they sat at meat in the great hall that evening, a damsel came in and bowed low before King Arthur. My lord, she said very humbly, I come from your sister, Queen Morgana, to beg her pardon of you for the wickedness that she has done. Never again after this day will she strive to hurt you, for the fiend has gone from her which tempted her to evil, and in token of her great love and true repentance, she sends you this mantle, the fairest in the world, and whoso wears it shall never suffer pain any more. When all saw the mantle, they marveled at it, for indeed it was passing fair, set all with precious stones and embroidered with gold and silver. And King Arthur was happy in the gift of the mantle, and put out his hand to take it. But the Lady Nimue who had returned to Camelot with him, cried out suddenly, Lord King, put not on the mantle until you know more of it. Let this damsel set it upon her own shoulders, ere it come on yours or any others in this hall. It shall be as you counsel me, said King Arthur. Damsel, I would see the mantle upon you. Sir, she said, I am not worthy to wear a king's robe. Nevertheless you shall wear it, commanded Arthur. And so, perforce, the damsel drew the mantle close about her, and immediately there was a bright burst of flame, and she fell to the ground, a heap of smoldering ashes. And after this, Queen Morgana le Fay dared never again enter the realm of Logris, but went to her own castle in the land of Gore, and fortified it strongly. <laughs>